Assalamu alaikum, namaskar, varankam. Um, very happy to be here today to share some ideas with you about water. I will begin with framing the issues. I will begin with a consciousness raising activity. Uh, you are all familiar with consciousness raising. I think many of the people in this room are working on consciousness raising. Certainly our director, uh, Vijay, Dr. Director Vijay, and uh, Kudai Kitmagar uh, folks who are here, and um, our dear friend Mustafa from Kerala, are working on consciousness raising. And I would like to do a framing, and then my uh, colleague and dear friend David Albert will go into detail about friendly water for the world's activities. But I thought it's important first to do some framing of what we are looking at here. And this is very much in the spirit of Mahatma Gandhi in the sense of movement work and constructive work. Of course, we have, uh, as uh, Director Vijay uh, referred, an exhibition right out here that's clearly about movement work. And we have uh, many sites around the city now that have some exciting things happening. My goodness, uh, we are here in solidarity with uh, all of you and all of them uh, along those lines as well. Uh, the constructive work also is very important. So we have so much appreciation for the Mahatma with, and all of the people who worked with him. One of the wonderful aspects of Mahatma Gandhi is it was not just about him. Many leaders these days, it's all about me, all about him. Uh, notice not her. We don't have that very much, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we have learned from this how important it is to do these things in solidarity together with people. So I'll also be talking about transformational leadership. And I'm guessing that many of the people in this room are transformational leaders. So. Uh, with much appreciation for the work that you all are doing, too, as we move into my talk here. So the evidence is very clear. We are now in the age of what many people call the Anthropocene, dominated by humans, or as uh, my friend David Albert likes to call it, the Capitalocene, dominated by capital and capitalism. But it is the dominance of humans over the biosphere and it is a suicidal path, as you are all aware. And much of what I will share with you is familiar to you already. However, I think it's important to keep coming back to these messages, to keep uh, reiterating these messages, very important, because we're facing uh, extinction as a species. We only have one home. We only have one spaceship. This is the photograph of what we have called the blue marble from one of the Apollo space missions in 1968. This was the first time as a planet that we had a consciousness of ourselves as a planet. But we only have one. There is no alternative. The temperature change in the last 50 years, as you all know, is very dramatic. When I first saw this map, I was interested that India is less dramatic uh, than some other places. But the places where it, their temperature change is having the most impact are the northern areas where there is a lot of ice. And that means water, but it means water melting into the oceans. It does not mean fresh water, and we must distinguish between those two. The global average temperature rise has been very dramatic, as we all know, uh, from the fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuels, fossil energy that we have. Sea level rise. Uh, is estimated uh, without global action, and it, appe it appears we've been talking for 20 years, 30 years about climate change, climate crisis, uh, but we've not done much about it. And it appears that at a conservative estimate, 132 centimeter sea uh, level rise, and that of course will compromise Mumbai, Kolkata, large parts of Bangladesh, and many other places as we all well know. And we already have coastal flooding, coastal surges. Cyclones have gotten stronger. In Japan, we have identified the phenomenon called guerrilla go in Japanese, which means uh, the guerrilla attack, like a guerrilla warfare, the guerrilla attack of rain, sudden rain, heavy, heavy rain in a short period of time, which causes terrible flash flooding and so on. The sea level rise, as you can see here on this map, is very dramatic in certain areas. Certain areas are less affected uh, but nevertheless, most areas are dramatically affected. 
goodbye Miami, goodbye New York, if we don't do anything. This is a photograph of Greenland that I took from the window of our airplane. We were flying back from Europe. We had flown over Greenland many times in the past. It was covered with ice. It was all white in the past. This time it was very dramatic to see how the ice has receded. And in the middle of Greenland, you can see these glacial rivers where the melt is happening. It's very dramatic. The Colorado River system in the United States which supplies most of the water for Nevada, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Arizona, is going dry. It's going dry. And you're familiar with this story from India as well. The global heating is supercharging the Indian Ocean. Uh, we are seeing uh, a, quite a dramatic shift in the patterns of rainfall and so on. We pray that the monsoons will continue, but we had better expect that there will be changes. Grass is now growing around Mount Everest. This came this morning also. I was, I was taken aback. You don't think of grass around Mount Everest, do you? And again, the Colorado River. Half the birds and three quarters of the insects in Germany have been recorded by scientists as gone since 1990. Gone. Simply, they do not, they no longer exist. Countless animals, mammals, reptiles, amphibians are in danger of extinction worldwide. On February 18th in the Hindu, India's bird population on the decline. I noticed it yesterday when we went to Miwat. I was, it was very dramatic for me. Uh, since I've been coming here for 50 years, I'm very familiar with the Indian countryside. I only saw one vulture in the entire day. In the past, I would see many vultures. The vultures are disappearing and many other birds with them. The list of species, according to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, is about 88,000. Those in danger of extinction, uh, 25,000. Uh, this, this, is, this is incredible to imagine this. I don't think any of us in this room when we were children ever imagined something like this happening. The decline in the number of bees, pollinating insects, it's not just bees, but other in pollinating insects as well, is also very dramatic. In the United States alone, uh, from 2.5 million uh, hives in uh, 2015 that dropped from 5 million in 1998. Who will pollinate our food? Who will pollinate our food? Some people have suggested, some pundits have suggested, oh, uh, we can have small drones to do this work for us. I'm not sure that the technological solutions are the way to go. It may be better to go back to the local level for the local solutions. And in this, of course, is a chart of global warming and climate change. These are systems issues. They are very complex systems issues. These are not binary or linear issues. These are issues which have deep connections with other issues. And we really need a deep education to understand what is happening here. Fossil fuels as an example of uh, carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, increasing the, the heat. Airplane flights, India, 6,300 flights per day in India. The U.S., commercial flights, 42,000 flights per day. In the world, the commercial flights are 100,000 airplanes in the air every day. Imagine that. It's, it's mind-boggling. And the total of all flights, including military and private flights, is over 50 million in a year. It's not surprising that we have a climate problem. Well, is it global warming or you know, climate ch change. No, it really is a global crisis. It is global ecocide that's happening. On top of this, we have a second existential crisis, which is about nuclear weapons. We are not making a dramatic enough uh, shift away from nuclear weapons. These are existential threats. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which of course, uh, the wonderful Indian atomic scientist, Abdul Halam, uh, was a member of, uh, began publishing this in the 1940s, and in the top left-hand corner here, you can see a clock. And the clock, the doomsday clock, is now closer to midnight than it has ever been. It's 100 seconds to midnight. And in the 1990s, we thought we were moving away from war and violence and all that. And in the 1990s, the doomsday clock was 17 minutes before midnight. So what has happened? Uh, in the past uh, 20 years or so. So the end of the world uh, as we know it, it it's ha happening. The evidence is very clear. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, as Greta Thunberg, this wonderful uh, Swedish student, has to say, we will be watching you. 
Uh, she emphasizes hope and action. We will be sharing with you some action that we are taking uh, at, a, at the local level. But the rules have to change, as Greta says, and it has to start today. Our, it's our responsibility, our accountability. It's not someone else's. There is, there is a need for hope, but there is a need for action. So how to change the path? The first thing we need to do is to pay more attention to sustainability and sustainability leadership, bringing forth sustainability uh, world, sustainable world. So what do we mean by sustainability? The Brundtland Commission of 1987 uh, says sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the future. We have not been thinking enough about the future generations. So American Indians, the red Indians in America, have this wisdom. You must look seven generations back and seven generations forward when you are considering any decision or plan. We also think about this as a three-legged stool, sustainability social well-being, economic stability, and environmental health. And as you will hear from David Albert, Friendly Water for the World aims for all three of these. I think in all of our work, we should be aiming for these three. So how do we get to sustainability? One way to do it is to imagine the future. Imagine a positive, optimistic future, and then we do a technique of what we call back casting. And then we, we come back to today and say, well, what do we need to do today to reach this sustainability world that we're looking for? So one way to do it is to look at the principles. One thing we need to do is to stop extracting so many fossil fuels from the earth. The fossil fuels are useful for other things than burning them in automobiles and airplanes and all. And reduce the waste created by society. We're very well aware of this, especially since plastic bags have been introduced to India. Although I have to say, it's gotten much better, and India is a leader in many of these things. Uh, I don't notice nearly as many plastic bags as I did 10 or 15 years ago in India. And India, I think, can be a leader. We, we talk about China as the leader of the 21st century. I'm not so sure about that. I think that India is more likely going to be the leader in the 21st century for many reasons. And we, the waste also includes food. Food waste is just very dramatic. The United States, every uh, year, half of the food that is produced is wasted. It is not consumed. Half of the food, it's just incredible to think about this. And of course, at the bottom here, very, very important, strive for social equity. We cannot continue with the system as it is now. So there's also the reciprocal nature of sustainability. It is a cycle. It's a loop. It's not a one-way process. So what do we need to do to survive? The most immediate crisis is water, access, quantity, and quality. This is going to become huge in the next uh, 10 years or so. So water is the key. Water is the key right now, especially at the local level. First, clean, accessible water. One example of activism is our, our group, Friendly Water for the World. And uh, we are looking for clean, pure water. And there are many reasons for that, but primarily the need for a healthy community. So locating the work. Again, the idea of movement work, Gandhian movement work, Gandhian constructive work. So the worker's home is one of these locations. This is in Gandhi Ram, Tamil Nadu. And we've been going here, David and I have been going there since 1977. And uh, we're very much part of the family there as well. It's a place for action. Many of the uh, world leaders of uh, human rights have been here. Uh, David, who was you were telling us that someone was in this room? No, the room next to it. This room. Bacha Khan. Bacha Khan was in, stayed in this room. And then uh, Martin Luther King Jr. also stayed here. Uh, and Nehru also stayed here. And this is a, an example. This is from one of the Friendly Water uh, trainings that we did a few years ago. This is a training facility that we have recently renovated. And we're doing trainings here. Uh, these are some women from Nepal, I think, uh, doing the training. Uh, this, this is a water catchment tank that, that we built uh, at Gandhi Grant. And you can see uh, the idea is to get the surplus rainwater, rainwater harvesting, which many of you in the room are familiar with the ideas about rainwater harvesting. So biosand water filters, David will talk more about that. Uh, again, the idea is clean, pure water. So what do we need to uh, survive again? We need transformational leaders. I'll just quickly go through this. Men and women. 
There's a need for we and us, not I or me. We need to shift that dialogue. We need younger leaders, the young, younger leaders in this room, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing the work that you do. Uh, and we need to appreciate the wisdom of the past. And I think particularly India has wisdom from the past. Mahatma Gandhi was channeling wisdom from before. He didn't invent all of those ideas. He put them all together into one place. So, and the need for exemplary activists, especially women. And I, I think that the Gita has, uh, you know, many, many things to teach us along these lines. The idea that it is your path, it's your duty. I often ask young activists, why are you doing this? Almost always the first answer is, it's my duty. I should be doing this. And we so appreciate that. It's, it really is an example of, uh, you know, uh, Krishna advising Arjuna. And there is a vulnerability in this, too, that's important. So the Dharma of Mahatma Gandhi, the Dharma of all of you, these roots of action, resistance, contemplation, and transformation. Uh, Vinobhaji is one of the examples of this. An amazing man, amazing person who did so many things uh, for India in the 1950s, particularly around consciousness. And this is a photograph of uh, the American Dick Kaitan, who became Indian. Uh, and it's through Dick Kaitan that I met uh, Amma and Appa, that I met uh, Jagannathan and uh, Krishnamal and Vinobhaji. This is Amma and Appa. Amma, Krishnamal, Jagannathan, we were just with her last week, uh, received the Padma Bhushan recently. She also received the Right Livelihood Award. The Right Livelihood Award is the alternative Nobel Prize. Please have a look at their website. Amazing activists honored every year by the Right Livelihood Award. It's out of Sweden. And uh, Krishnamal and Jagannathan received that. So Satyagraha in action. And I want to also note, I didn't know this, but I heard a talk uh, a few weeks ago by a professor from Fatima College in Madurai, Shobana Nalasko. And Shobana was pointing out that Satyagraha actually uh, began with Kasturbai. Began not with Gandhi, but with Gandhi's wife. And it's an interesting story. I could tell you the story later if you're interested. But they're freedom fighters. We are talking about freedom fighters. Uh, in a sense, we are all still walking with Gandhiji. This is Amma at the workers' home. You can see one thing. She is a Dalit, uh, so-called untouchable. And yet, when we meet Amma, the first thing she does is gives you a hug. And she shakes your hand. And I so appreciate the other day uh, I was listening to Faisal Bai talking about what we should do. And he said, you should hug a Muslim. You want to hug a Muslim. It's very important. Well, we should hug everyone. So need for women leaders. There's a whole list here. I won't uh, linger on this one. But uh, this idea, this is a Tamil magazine, Krishnamal on the front uh, cover here. In America, we had a, an activist named Dolores Huerta. I shouldn't say we had. She's still alive. She's 89 years old. Uh, this is Mika and I meeting Dolores Huerta. She was the head of the United Farm Workers, and they had a, a great strike in the 1960s against grape boy boycott. We all stopped eating grapes at the time. And she succeeded in getting uh, human rights for the farm workers. And sh she invented this phrase in Spanish, si se pueda, which means, yes, yes, we can do it. And Barack Obama took that phrase and brought it into his political campaigns. So she's really America's ama in so many ways. And I'll end with this. Uh, we visited the Birla House the other day. I had never been there. I've been to Rajkot many times. Uh, I had not been to Birla House. And Mahatma Gandhi, I'm praying for the light that will dispel the darkness. Let those who have living faith in nonviolence join me in the prayer. A wonderful uh, phrase of the Mahatma. And uh, for Sarvodia, the people who are doing the service, like all of you. And perhaps it's a new dawn. We'll see. So thank you all very much. Our mission is to expand global access to low-cost clean water technologies and information about health and sanitation. But the key is we are not a charity. We do knowledge sharing and training. We believe that it is not a good idea to give anyone anything for free when with the proper tools and proper training they can do it for themselves. This is obviously Gandhian principles. Uh, around constructive work and also around Nikaili. We work with the most marginalized and disadvantaged people. This is worldwide. 
We're working in 10 countries right now. We work with widows, people with HIV, former child soldiers, especially in the Congo, tribal communities in Dalits, people with albinism, a condition that makes your skin too white, and if you have this condition, condition in Tanzania, you may be killed. Survivors of wartime rape and sexual violence, this, some of the situations we deal with every day are unbelievable. They see themselves as victims. They don't see the assets in their own communities. And one of the things we have to do is simply give them an, enough courage to understand the assets that they have. As I said, we do knowledge sharing and training. We are trying to build community self-sufficiency. I've been at this for 50 years. I still can't find anything better than Ram Swaraj. Just can't. I don't know how to get there. I've never built a single village. But nonetheless, that ideal still seems to me the best possible ideal moving forward. And then finally, effective altruism. We try to show both people here, but in the United States, that you can do away amazing things with very small amounts of money. The idea that you don't need to have billions, you don't have to be, have a, be a millionaire, you don't have to have millionaire factories, but that you can make really massive changes with just very small inputs. So, this picture, I took this picture in Uganda, it's actually the town of, uh, village of Kasana. This nine-year-old boy, both of his parents had HIV, and they were getting weaker, and so they took the boy out of school, and he walks nine kilometers twice a day to bring this water home, that's the only water they have, to the family. Uh, by the way, his parents are now healthy. We've gotten them healthy, and in fact, in the village of Kasana, with 59 families with HIV, we have had no deaths since 2014. I actually took this picture in 2013. Now, this is school recess. You think recess should be a time to play, to work with your friends? No. These children, in the middle of the school day, go to this place to collect water to take home to their families. This is government-approved water source. It has a government stamp and a seal of approval. You like this water? You all ready to drink this water? I wouldn't drink the water there. But it has a government stamp on it. BioSand filter is a very simple uh, device. Um, it's an adaptation of the slow sand filter from 4,000 years ago. Um, it takes the actions of a pond and it essentially encloses them in a box, in a cement box. And we can reduce all waterborne illnesses between 99% and 100% without chemicals, without electricity, all using materials available in the village. So this is in Rwanda. That they've just had a biotech filter installed, and the children are asking, what is that? With the child on his lap in the middle is Richard Shambadi, our um, representative in Uganda. By the way, an interesting story is Father had three wives, a Christian wife, a Muslim wife, and an animist wife, and they all lived in the same house. And uh, he actually is the, the son of the Muslim wife. And this is a village in uh, southwest Uganda, and there was war going through, and the soldiers were raping the women, giving them HIV. And they also had a particular disease called cryptosporidiosis, which you find often in hilly areas. And so this one man decided he was going to start an orphanage. He had no organization, no church, no rotary club, no government, no nothing. He, was, he and his friends decided they were going to start an orphanage. He thought he'd have 50 children, and he had four, got four on and he writes me in late 2013 and says, David, I've got a problem. I'm managing with the 400 orphans, but one-fifth of all the children under the age of five are dying before their fifth birthday. Immediately we're able to diagnose. I could diagnose, actually. It was easy to tell that it was crypto. And um, so with $100, I said, Richard, get on a bus. He got on a bus with two biosand filters, 
and some sand and gravel and some education materials. He went there, installed the two filters, and 18 days later, I heard, David, it's a miracle. There's not one case of dysentery, not one case of diarrhea, not even a stomachache. And today, because of all the money they've saved on medical care, they've built a beautiful school for all 400 children. They fixed up the orphanage. It's great. And it was all money they saved in medical care. This is my friend Gabula Milton Andrew from Eastern Uganda. He started an organization in 2003 to stop child <coughs> sacrifice. I could tell you a long story about the child sacrifice, but I won't. But um, the boys on Fridays, girls on Saturdays. It's supported by all religious leaders, Christian, animist, Muslim. And this happens in Uganda. But along the way, he ends up with a school for 50 kids with HIV, an orphanage for 50 kids with HIV, a school for 375 children with HIV, a vocational training institute for people with HIV, and he supports grandparents who take in their grandchildren when the parents die of AIDS. He writes me in late 2014, says, David, I've got a problem. I know what's coming. Four of my children are in the hospital with waterborne illnesses. If I pay the hospital bill, I have no food for the children. So I said, you know, Capulon, you know I've been supporting you for years. I'm not in the food business. I'll, we'll find some money for food. But I can tell you, I can make sure this will never happen again. We installed two biosand filters. Same story, three weeks later, everyone healthy. He started making the filters himself. He, they built and sold more than 1,500 filters. Anyone who's worked in development for a long time knows that the key to development are mothers. There is no real development without focusing on mothers. The reason is they care for the culture of the community. They care for the future of the community. That is the children. They care for the husbands too, but, all right. um, but that if you really want to do development work right, you really have to start with mothers. Because no mother wants to have a sick child. That's the key. It's a simple key. The men may control everything else, but the mother is the one who takes care of the children. So we started a program working with mothers. This is actually in Tanzania. This was a community that had many children dying of, of typhoid in this particular community. They are now making biosand filters and they're all healthy. And now I want to tell you a sad story. This is the town of Minova in the Congo, Eastern Congo. Many of you probably don't know it, but the biggest war in the world is not in Afghanistan, it is not in Iraq, it's not in Syria, it's not in Libya, it's not in Ukraine, it's in Congo. Seven million people have died in the last 20 years in the ongoing war in Eastern Congo. Why? So that your cell phone should work. The coltan that makes your cell phone and computer screen works, 80% of it comes from, from Congo. So in 2012, war going on all the time, the Congolese National Army and United Nations forces fought battles with militia groups in a big city, two million people of Goma, and the United Nations and the government troops lost. And they retreated 60 miles where they proceeded to rape 141 women and pillaged the entire town. After the rapes, their husbands all left them. They couldn't work their fields anymore because there was not enough labor. Many of them contracted HIV, and some of them had children by their rapists. And this is what they looked like when we got there in 2016. We taught them, we said, you know, we can provide employment for you. We taught them to make biosand water filters. And within the first six, uh, within the first three months, they built 700 of them, sold them all, had healthy children, had enough money to send their children back to school, had stopped cholera in two refugee camps, and um, the program kept on expanding. The, the, every school bought biosand filters so that the children in the schools could be healthy. And the local government, and there's not a lot of government to speak of, decreed that every um, uh, restaurant 
and cafe had to have Ohio sand filters. This is what they look like today, plus with my friend Claire Campbell, who was with me in Gandhi Grum last week. And in 2018, they won the world's most prestigious prize for sustainability, the Energy Global Award from Austria, for empowering the women of Minova through clean water technologies. The story extends. We were doing a training, and when I say we, Americans are not going there. It's all local folks that we've trained. We're doing a training in a village about 50, 60 miles to the south. 20, 20 women, four men. And on the first day of the training, 26 women, these 26 women, showed up at 10 a.m. on the first day and they said, we will be trained. You will train us. There's no plan for them. And, and we said, well, well, we've only planned for 24. We only have enough food for 24. Um, we don't have enough materials. They said, no, we are not leaving until you train us. They walked seven kilometers um, each day back and forth in order to stay with the five-day training. And we trained them. And then, then, then things happened. Now, why did they come? In the previous year, of these 26 women, 18 of them had children who died from cholera. This is the woman who was their leader. What happened? She had a sister who was in Minova, who had learned, was making biosand filters, had money to send her kids to school, everyone was healthy. And she came down to visit her sister, and she offered the sister some water. She says, no, I won't drink your water. I only drink water from a biosand filter. Explain what that was, and this woman gathered 25 women, talked about what she had heard, and heard about the training somehow, and said to all the men, we are leaving. You are taking care of the children. We're not doing our jobs. We'll be back. And the men all said, you know, I guess that's the way it is. And the men took care of the children and did all the cooking while the women went. And now, in the this was in September last year, they have built more than 110 biosand water filters, and they're all healthy. Now we'll get to India. This is our South India coordinator, uh, Lidwin. And uh, I've always said, Lidwin, the biosand filter should be the most beautiful thing in the house. Well, she's a painter. And so she started painting them. And this was one of her first ones. Water in India is terrible. You know, we have water experts here. They could give you this lecture as well as I could, but I'm going to go review what the data says. There is less water availability, much less of it is clean enough to drink. The water table is dropping precipitously all over the country. Recharge areas are completely paved over with parking lots and new houses. You should see what Madurai looks like. The old tanks are completely paved over. Aquifers can't be recharged. Rivers are polluted. In Gujarat, there is not a single river in the entire state that you can drink from. Deeper wells are bringing up extremely dangerous levels of fluoride. I, we see this in northern Karnataka, um, as, as well as in Bihar. But northern Karnataka, the wells are now going 1,400 feet deep. And the children have twisted bones as a result of the fluoride being brought up. The Green Revolution. Um, this is in particularly in Bihar and Bengal. Arsenic is washed down from the Himalayas. The water is pumped up on the green, re for green Revolution crops. It's putting arsenic into the food and water supply. Wells are running dry everywhere. Industrial agriculture is exhausting aquifers. This is my favorite photo of the whole presentation. Anyone know where this is? No? Yamuna. Yamuna. This is Delhi. I have a name for this photo. My, my name for this photo is development. <laughs> you see people who are doing their rituals in the river. I mean, no matter what state the, the river is in, they have to do their rituals. So there is the culture, and they are poisoning themselves in this river. The foam is coming from factories upstream. You all know that. The, the, the factories are funded by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the Ford Foundation and whatever for the factories. So that's what all this foam is. 
Then there is a bridge being built overhead because your food is coming from further and further away all the time. Trucks, you know about the trucks, burning fossil fuels all over the place. So that's the bringing the food into Delhi. And this is the drinking water supply for New Delhi. And that's why I call this photo development. The water utilities in every major Indian city is, are overwhelmed. Sewage treatment has not kept pace with population growth. Waterborne diseases that you haven't seen in decades are recurring. There's cholera in Karnataka, Punjab, Bengal, Dr Orissa, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, and Haryana. I want to talk about cholera in UP. We do some work um, with communities, the Musa M Musaha in Bihar and the Gihar people. So we asked our person working with them, do you have cholera cases? He says, we have many deaths every year. But if you ask the UP government, they will tell you, we don't have any deaths. And if you ask the national government, they'll say, we don't have any deaths because we get the data from the UP government. And if you ask the World Health Organization, they'll say, oh, no, there are no cholera deaths in, in UP. Those of you who are researchers, be careful around, about your data. A lot of the data is simply not true. And all you have to do is go to your villages to find that out. RO systems are going to be banned, I hope. They waste five gallons of water for every one gallon gained, and the minerals and salts are removed, and we have an epidemic among rich people in Chennai. 21 cities are supposed to run out of water by 2021. Chennai, what happened last year, is a harbinger of things to come. They ran out of water. They closed hotels. They closed, they, they, they closed so many things around Chennai. And people started moving from Chennai back to the countryside. You always think of the going the other way. The people in the countryside are moving into the cities. Wait five years. People are going to be moving from the cities to the countryside. Infant and child mortality. Now, India has the most wonderful public health system. It's unbelievably wonderful. But we see child malnutrition, but it's not from lack of food. Rather, it is that people can't, the children can't digest their food because of waterborne illnesses. India ranks below Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh in this. Children are missing two out of every five days of school. Girls are leaving school early. There's a condition I want you to make sure you understand. It is called parasitic stress. So the public health system has made it so there's less child mortality, infant mortality in India. But the result is the children are using the energy they're taking in between the ages of one and five to fight off parasites. So instead of building their brains and building their bodies, they're fighting parasites. And the result of this is permanent cognitive impairment. You can send your six-year-old to school, but they're not going to learn because their brains are already damaged between the ages of one and five. In India, it is estimated that more than 20% of youth under age 21 have permanent cognitive damage. It has been called the largest loss of human potential in the history of the world, happening in India today. 48% of Indian children are malnourished. The large majority have enough to eat. A third of them come from wealthy families, but it is because they cannot digest their food properly. Parasitic stress I talked about. There is now an increased risk for adult illnesses such as diabetes, heart attacks, and strokes. When I first came to India in 1977, I didn't see people with diabetes. Some of, it is, some of this is linked to the water conditions. And the stunting, you have lots of stunting problems in India, again, and the largest loss of human potential in world history. This is in Musafapur. Um, the water went in looking like orange juice. This is the water people usually drink. So I want to talk about a project we're currently involved in, and we were there yesterday. We did this project with Kude Kitmatgar. We're working with the Rohingya refugees. I do not need to repeat what Rohingya refugees are about to, to you. You know as well as we do. And we brought 35 people together. This is, this is what, uh, this is Camp 3. Uh, this is what the conditions are in this camp. In this camp of 42 
families, one child was dying every two to three months, usually from cholera, which doesn't exist in Haryana. This is a picture I took in Camp 3. People have said that is the saddest they have ever seen me look in my entire life. And that's probably true. Every single person in this, in this place was sick. By the way, this camp looks worse. There's a camp right next to it, Camp 1, which looks actually a lot better. And the reason is, it was burned to the ground. You know where this picture is taken? I was invited to have tea here. They have one well. It's an indentation in the ground so that when the rains come, they have two feet of water. They have one well. It only goes 70 feet deep, and it's completely contaminated with sewage. It's, they have total water supply in this place. So just yesterday, literally yesterday, we interviewed people from two families. We did Abdul Karim's family first. And prior to the, he had four children, prior to the biosand filter, children were constantly sick, sick, sick. He spent 1,500 rupees per month on hospitals, clinics, and medications. Now, mind you, these are refugees. They don't have money. Now, very rare. Expenditures. For a $50 investment, he would save $250 a year, or $1,250 over five years. Any business people here? Yeah, I have a business person here. Uh, it's a good investment. Um, if the funds were used for school fees, better food, family needs. Uh, and the father has become a builder and promoter of the filters. Here he is speaking to a group of refugees yesterday. Second family, eight children. Prior to the biosand filter, the family spent 6,000 rupees per month now they are only spending 1,000 rupees a month. They saved $840 in the first year. Over five years, they will save $4,200. And we're providing filters for 35 families. We don't usually provide filters, they are, and they're all paying us something for them. But the idea is we've interviewed 35 families. We have a list of all their health conditions, how many days of school they missed, and how much they spent on medications. They will come back, we will come back in three months, and we will ask exactly the same questions to measure the outcome data. We have projects in Himachal, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. Um, we're expanding. We, have we, we don't only do biosand filters, we do rainwater catchments, microflush toilets, non-fired soil stabilized bricks, we teach people to make soap, rocket stoves. These are basically different forms of smokeless chulas, uh, perma gardens, and I will show you briefly what they are. This is a group of people with albinism that we were training to build rainwater catchment systems. This is the finished system. We just trained a, a group yesterday, finished, six women masons who are building 12 of these for schools in Manzi, Zambia, just yesterday. But this, we said, now, we looked at India and said, if India is becoming a desert, we have to learn from the desert people. So we sent four people to Rajasthan, to the Tar Desert, where they have another form of rainwater catchment called the Tanka. We, we are learning how to make them, and we are work, going to work on two projects where we are going to train people in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh to make these. Non-fired soil stabilized bricks. You make bricks, you waste all that fuel, and you waste water, unnecessarily. Simple manual machine can make interlocking bricks, 40% cheaper than other bricks, and they're stronger. They're made of earth. This is our headquarters in Uganda. No cement, no mortar. We're beginning to teach this in Tamil Nadu. We expect to roll it out for Microflush toilet, it's much like your tiger toilets. You use worms to eat the feces. You don't have to muck them out for two or two and a half years. So they're very, very efficient. You get good compost out of them. People like to use them. And they only require one quarter cup of water 
which, with each flush. We went to Congo, and we said, you know, you need to wash your hands with soap. And the people said to us, what is soap? They didn't have soap. So we taught them to make liquid soap, and it's selling like hotcakes. It's selling all over the place. And then finally, we found an adaptation of permaculture. You have permaculture in India. But we said, what if you have an elderly person who can no longer work in the fields, but wants to grow all the vegetables they need all year round next to their house? Well, we found a way to do it. We didn't invent it, but we are using this technology. It's very simple. You take up all the topsoil, and you dig 18 inches further. You combine it with a lot of compost. You make channels on the earth. Then you put it, put it all back in. You make it so that the water running off the roof will go to a hole, which is going to go underground, to a basically an underground tank. And even when it is dry for six months, you will be growing vegetables all year round. Very simple technology, and it works. Current projects, we're hoping to work on a joint project in Maywat um, on water catchment. We are hoping to put together a model village in Umaria, Madhya Pradesh, uh, which will use all the technologies. We're working on a demonstration, Inamul is in charge of this one, a demonstration project with Nalanda Way Academy. Nalanda Way Academy is this wonderful academy for gifted Dalit youth. And they may be at the top of their class, but they're really not prepared to go to central universities. Or, so they take 275 Dalit youth from all over the country and 10 months, 12 hours a day, they work on English, maths, test-taking skills, how to interview, how to, how to take tests, um, how to combat bullying, how to make friends with people with other castes. 12 hours a day, they do this. But the problem is, they ran out of water. And so we're hoping to help them with water technologies um, in the coming months. Uh, this is going to be a demonstration project it's near Severgram, so people who visit Severgram can go visit the project. We're also working with backward communities in UP and Bihar, uh, including the Gihars and Musahars. The project with the Gihars is very interesting. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>